But uh, next, we're going to talk about money in politics and, well, money from politics, perhaps. Uh, and Andrea will be telling us about that today. Uh, Dr. Andrea Leong is an executive member of the Federal Science Party and the leader of the New South Wales State Branch. Uh, she studied biomedical science at Monash University in Melbourne, then worked in the Biointerface Engineering Group at Swinburne University. She moved to Sydney in 2011 to do a PhD on antibacterial si surface coatings with the Brian Holden Vision Institute and UNSW. Andrea now works in microbiome research for small pharma, having seen collaborative bioscience from academic, not-for-profit not and industry perspectives. Andrea is interested in how this work is supported and whether we're doing it right. So her topic, science funding, is ours optimal? Andrea. Thanks, Aaron. Now, how does this work? Science. Yes. All right, cool. Thank you. So um, when we talk about science funding, numbers, big numbers tend to get thrown around without perhaps regard for whether they're really truly being comprehended. So we hear things like oh, $2 billion announced for research infrastructure over the next 12 years, things like that. And that's great um, because that provides the stability that researchers need to make those um, big uh, discoveries. Um, and it also helps retain expertise when you've got funding that is pledged over a long period. For example, the CSIRO has had to drop a lot of staff recently uh, in really specialised areas like oceanography and biodiversity research and you don't get another 10, 20, 50 jobs like that just popping up next door when that funding is dropped. So when that happens, those researchers either move into a different field, a different sector, or move overseas and then that expertise is lost and not easily regained. That said, um, comparing science funding from year to year with you know these numbers that get talked about, um, it is difficult to really grasp whether we're funding science more or less from year to year and how we compare with other countries. So tonight I'm going to try to break so down some of those big numbers and hopefully leave you uh, with the confidence to talk about science funding and with an opinion as to whether we should be funding science more or less, hopefully not less. So this is not a story, this is just a collection of facts which is just as exciting. So the first thing I'll talk about is the first, this first distinction in Australian R&D, research and development spending. Uh, who is doing the spending? Businesses actually do a lot of the R&D in Australia. Universities do a fair bit, not-for-profits do a little bit, and the federal government also does a fair bit of the R&D funding in Australia. So politicians will talk about increasing Australia's science funding. And when they do so, it can be a little bit dishonest because they'll talk about raising the overall science spend. Obviously, the government can really only directly influence this portion, the government's spending. But the government can, that said, the government can create the right conditions for these other sectors, businesses, universities, not-for-profits, to, uh, to be comfortable and well supported to spend on R&D. Um, so, just speaking of how much these relative uh, sectors do spend, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands here to yeah, audience participation. Uh, what percentage of the federal budget do you think the government spends on R&D? So the federal budget is about 480 million, sorry, billion dollars. And I'm gonna ask if you think it's about 1%, 2%, 5% or 10% spent on R&D. Can I get a show of hands for 1%? 2%? 5%? Or 10%? Yeah, 10% would be pretty optimistic. It is actually 2%. Um, so we might think it's a little lower than it is. Uh, I saw a lot of hands go up for 1%. Um, actually, we're not that low on science spending. Sorry, what am I hitting here that's making the microphone? Is it that? I don't know. Okay, 2% is what we spend on science. So for the visual learners here, science and not science. Okay, so 
how does the government divvy up this little sliver of science funding here, which amounts to about $10 billion? Uh, it goes through a lot of agencies, for example, the CSIRO, which we heard about. Um, you know, they've got a very diverse portfolio. There's more, uh, uh, what's word? I was going to say concentrated, focused. Focused agencies like um, ARENA, the Renewable Energy um, Funding Agency, and ANSTO in uh, nuclear research. Uh, there's also the various government departments which uh, uh, portion up funding as they see fit towards R&D. And then there's the NHMRC and the ARC, which Tom briefly mentioned. So these are the bodies that fund grants that uh, researchers apply for. Uh, between them, the NHMRC, the National Health and Medical Research Council, and the ARC, Australian Research Council, which has a broader scope. Between them, they've got about a hundred, sorry, one and a half billion dollars of grant funding to divvy up. So at the moment, these, these agencies get a lot more applications than they're able to fund. So about half of the grant applications that come through are deemed worthy of funding, so they're good projects, but only about half of those can be funded because they just don't have enough money. So remember that one about half of the projects that are deemed worthy can be funded and the rest just go unfunded, they miss out. I think I'll just also mention that when you've got funding by application, how those applications are assessed can bring a certain amount of bias into the sorts of funding, the sorts of science that gets funded. So we don't just look at the merit of the project, unfortunately. We also look at the track record of the researchers. And while having a good track record in gaining funding and being invited to speak at conferences as a keynote speaker and things like that, they do indicate a certain prowess in research. But it does tend to crowd out younger researchers, newer researchers who may have newer and innovative ideas. So I think we should be looking at these applications for funding purely on the basis of merit without regard to what those same researchers have been awarded in the past. All right. Um, so I also just wanted to mention the R&D tax incentive here. So that's one of the ways that the government creates a, an environment for businesses to do R&D. It's not counted in that 2% uh, there because it's not um, an expense. It is revenue, tax revenue that is foregone. But I wanted to give credit where credit is due. It's pretty big. So that's about $3 billion of tax incentives that are given to businesses um, every year. Although it's, it's been increasing. So I think the government seeing this as a bit of a blowout. Um, I think it's doubled in the last five years or so. I don't know if, James, you... They're, they're cracking down. Yeah, so there's a... Um, some, what, if, what is it, new integrity standards that they're going to assess these projects a little bit more stringently. So the new integrity standards are a good thing, R and maybe. The R&D tax incentive itself is a good thing, so credit where credit is due. Um, so that's how our federal government spends its approximately $10 billion on R&D every year. And now to look at this from year to year and compare with other countries, I'm going to have to now look at it in a little bit of a different way. So on the last chart slide I showed you the federal budget, oh here it is again, remember this guy, the, uh, the federal budget here, science and not science. So now we're going to look at the science spend as a proportion or as a percentage of GDP. So gross domestic product or GDP is a measure of all the monetary value of the goods and services produced by a country. It's not a good measure of the, necessarily a good measure of the health of an economy or of the, uh, the, um, the satisfaction with life that maybe everyone has in a country, but it is, what we're looking at here is funding and that's exactly what it's good for measuring. So, the GDP includes the federal budget, so the federal budget is a subset of GDP, and this is the science spend uh, as a proportion of GDP. So this here is the government proportion uh, with its little science sliver, and here's the rest, all of the 
government, non-government spending. And this little, little bit here is the uh, R&D spending by sectors other than government. So business, charity and university science funding is this wedge here. So it's interesting to note that the proportions are fairly similar. That's also about 2% of the entire GDP is R&D funding from all sectors. So that kind of mirrors the 2% funding uh, of government spending as uh, a proportion of the federal budget. Okay, so um, is that clear? This is really, uh, yeah, um, a difficult topic to get your head around sometimes. So um, what has it been historically if we're sitting on about 2% now? Well, it's been, it, it changes a little bit and unfortunately where we are now, this is 2014-15 but it hasn't changed much in the last few years. It's been higher, it hasn't really been lower than where we are now for the last 40 years so that's a little bit disappointing. So given the, the difference from here at 0.55% to 0.7%, we really, if we wanted to, we could pull that funding from elsewhere and fund science as we have in the past, if we wanted to, that's just a decision. So um, other countries do it. Where do we sit in the, uh, in the ranking? So looking at the Australian spend on R&D, this is the federal government spend. Now you'll notice this is ABS data and it says uh, we spent 5.5% on uh, funding, this is 0.4%, so it's a little bit different but uh, it wouldn't change our ranking very much either way. So, we'll just go ahead with this. So federal expenditure on, uh, government expenditure on R&D, we rank really quite low um, compared to other OECD countries. But when you look at the overall spending, um, including industry, so the private spending as well, we move way up the ranking. So what this shows us here is that Australian businesses are picking up the slack putting us in about the middle of the pack. Um, I just want to point out here that South Korea is up here spending about twice as much, right, twice as much, remember that, as we are, okay. Um, and I also want to point out that when business is picking up the slack, you can also get a bias to the type of research that's being done because they'll be looking for those short-term gains, which is great. That's an important part of the picture and um, it is important to have these collaborations between academia and industry because sometimes academics are the last person in the world who should be commercialising their own research, which is fine, again. Um, yeah, but businesses do tend to focus on that research that has a short-term return, so the opposite of moonshots, basically. So, um, let's take a closer look at a few other select countries um, in their R&D spending. So here's Australia's spend, higher education here and the business spend, which um, I think I mentioned before is the biggest proportion of science spending. Here's the government in grey and that little tiny sliver of not-for-profit spending, um, making up our science spend. So, I mean, we could be pessimistic and say we've seen a little bit of a decline in the last uh, 10 years, but I think uh, optimistically we can say this is stagnating, we can recover from this. New Zealand, I just put in there because I like New Zealand, they see how notice that their government and their higher education spends are maybe similar to ours but their business sector spends a lot less. It'll be interesting, this is um, only a data up to 2015 so that'll be interesting to see if that increases as their space agency and space industry takes off, no pun intended. So we can, this is uh, where Australia is at, around the 2% of GDP mark. Um, Israel is a huge R&D spender, uh, with about 4% of their GDP being spent on R&D, and almost all of that is taken up by business. So government um, has very little of the R&D spend in Israel, but that just shows that it can be done. Are they a special case? Korea, as well, um, mentioned them on the last slide. They've increased, they've doubled their science funding in the last uh, 18 years. So I think that goes to show that it can be done, 
uh, if we want. And in Korea, um, um, as opposed to Israel, government has come along for the ride or perhaps been supporting that rise. So, could Australia do it? Here is the Science Party's anti-mascot. Whenever we say we want to double science funding, that's what we want to do, someone says, but who's going to pay for it? Well, if the question is where are we going to pull $10 billion from other budget items, then the answer is straightforward. We can pull that from uh, perverse tax incentives. They've got the capital gains tax discount, um, other incentives for big business. Um, we've got fossil fuel subsidies that we should not be paying. Um, but is that really the right question to be asking? So in the Science Party, we want to ask the right questions so we get useful answers, good quality answers. So the question in this case should be, what is the return on science spending? Who indeed is going to pay for it? Maybe we don't need to pay for it at all. So here's a, a quote from the CSIRO annual report from 2016-17. The estimated present value of benefits from CSIRO's work is approximately $3.2 billion per year. This is almost three times the total annual CSIRO budget. So great, there's some new information. The return seems to be about three times on the amount that we put in. We get three times back. Great. Uh, but that's only one data point. Can we find anything else? Relative to the funds committed to the CRC program, that's the cooperative research centres, which are collaborations between industry and universities. Relative to the funds committed to the CRC program by the Australian government, the CRC program has generated a net economic benefit to the community which has exceeded its costs by a factor of 3.1. So there's that number again. So I think we're starting to maybe feel pretty confident this is um, a good estimate of the return that we can get on governmental uh, science funding about three times. And this is from 2012, so that holds true. That's great. So I think it's time we can probably act on this and start to put more money into science funding to reap those rewards, look at it as an opportunity rather than a cost. But what's this? There is a high correlation between the wealth of nations in terms of gross domestic product per capita and research and development intensity. Great, another data point. This is from 1997, from a paper written by a parliamentary staffer who's done a lot of really interesting research. And this was 20 years ago. So we've been sitting on our hands all this time. So that's, that's pretty mind-blowing negligence when you think about it, that we know that science and research is a, it's a positive effect on the national budget, and yet we just, we just haven't been doing it. I, I don't understand why. So, um, that is why the Science Party wants to double research funding. That'll take us to being among the top science funding nations in the world, and though all of those applications for grants that were deemed worthy will be able to be funded. So, um, I'm just going to finish on Science Party policy. So, in addition to doubling research funding, we want to ensure that we have a Minister for Science and Research, along with a Minister for Innovation and in Industry. It's absurd that this should need to be said, but uh, we're now in the second period in the last five years that we have not had a dedicated science minister. We do have a, an assistant minister for science to the minister for industry. So, um, yeah, absurd, but turns out it does need to be said. Um, so we have some priority areas here. Um, they're pretty broad. I think it's important to have some broad areas to make sure that we don't... Um, miss out on huge sectors um, in terms of what gets research funding and what doesn't. But some of the announcements made by the government are very specific. Things like the National Carp Control Plan. Um, I, I would not doubt the, in, uh, the advice of experts from, say, the Invasive Animals Cooperative Research Centre if they say we need to reduce the number of carp in the Murray-Darling system but I think that should be left to them and not announced as a static government priority. So I think that it has the potential to undermine some confidence in the, uh, the, the way the government allocates funding if they are announcing some very, very specific areas like this. So that's why we stick to these broad priority areas. 
So as well as funding for research, um, we've got to take a holistic approach and nurture the science industry both from the top down and the bottom up. So that includes, for example, we have our space policy, which Tom touched on. And uh, number one was establish a space Australia, uh, an Australian space agency. Done. So I'm not saying that it was us that did it, but I, I'm just saying we had a space agency policy and now we have a space agency. <laughs> Other points in our policy are to incentivise Australian space infrastructure and that is uh, facilities for launching satellites, which is a huge opportunity area that we could move into and also to undertake a space innovation and growth strategy study. So we're coming to the end of our decadal plan for science planning and it would do us well to have a coherent plan for space research into the next 20 years. And um, again, something that Tom touched on is our education policy. So we want to make sure we have plenty of young people interested in science and technology uh, into the future. So we want to make sure STEM is, <laughs> <laughs> science is hilarious. Um, uh, that includes strong STEM education at the primary and secondary levels, including um, computer programming from a young age because scientists of all stripes are going to need that sort of skill in the future. Um, I'm a biologist, I find myself lacking because now we generate so much more data than we used to, so much more quickly. So computer programming is a skill that's uh, going to be very much needed by scientists of all stripes and affordable tertiary education as well. Uh, we've recently had the government uh, reducing the um, income level at which graduates have to repay HECS. Now, if people are not paying back their HECS because they don't have anywhere near the median wage, I think the solution is not to make them poorer. The solution is to create more incentives, sorry, not more incentives, um, an environment uh, within the economy that can accommodate them. So as, again, uh, mentioned earlier, we've got more PhD graduates than we have positions for those PhD graduates. Um, and this is, yeah, it's a holistic strategy to make sure we have lots of people interested in science and lots of science jobs for these people to go into and support the science industry from all angles. Thank you. <laughs>